Welcome to the uh, third session of our electrophysiology training workshop. And no, not this one. Don't well, this one. Yeah. So it sounds a bit good. So welcome to the third session of our um, electrophysiology training workshop. And um, Today's topic is going to be um, Statistics 1, in which we are going to look into a little into uh, spa some basic statistical concepts, and then we are going to look across a number of statistical uh, um, biases, which um, usually come up and should ideally be um, uh, avoided if possible. And next week we are going to do some uh, statistical modeling where we basically um, put uh, what we learned today into um, uh, practice and, um, yeah, as I said, um, adjust some models to some data and learn how to do that in a couple of different ways. Anyway, let's jump into um, today's um, session. And we're going to um, start with some statistical concepts. And the first is the um, law of large numbers. And the law of large numbers, um, well, this this one I wanted to make it a little more uh, interactive, so, um, which, which means we are going to start with a poll. Um, if you observed some, like, group level effect, uh, would you think that applies to, like, all subjects that you just investigated? Okay, uh, <coughs> uh, the concept of that question kind of goes in the direction of the law of large numbers. If you do some um, statistical test or um, like evaluating a hypothesis or something similar, you always assume that your data is uh, distributed in a certain way. Like if you, as the question says, you did something, you observed something on a group level, hence you got some uh, um, observation like uh, one group having a higher mean in something than the other group but that kind of idea starts to uh, break down if you are looking into um, individual subjects therefore if you want to know whether the stuff applies to individual subjects you r literally always have to go through all of them manually so uh, regarding the question I guess Depending on the situation, it can be either no or maybe, but you have to investigate that. And um, to give you another example, let's say uh, we would have some uh, tombola where I, um, either of you could win $150 here. We have uh, 15 boxes and um, if I basically uh, run the st um, test a couple of, uh, well, test, if I run this uh, tombola a couple of times and let um, sufficiently um, many people uh, um, give suffi sufficiently many people a shot at it I'm gonna lose like um, ten dollar on average per try but again that only works if I have like a super large uh, sample size if I, have, um, if I have like free samples I wouldn't estimate my projected loss at thirty dollars because that would be um, wouldn't be applicable it would only, uh, something like that would only be applicable if I had a large sample size. So, uh, the second concept I quickly wanted to talk about is the um, relationship between correlation and uh, yeah, causal, causality. And my question then would be again, that is. So, which of those statements is correct?
um, <clears throat> it's kind of uh, fundamental to have like a really solid understanding of that one because um, that gets like uh, twisted quite oftenly and it's really important to understand that especially when uh, you have people uh, writing papers they quite often observe some kind of correlative relationship like uh, we gave people a certain drug after that they felt better for whatever reason that's that's, that's a correlation that doesn't necessarily mean that the, it's the drug that made them feel better it's just an observation that you made and hence if you have some correlating behavior it doesn't necessarily uh, necessitate that there's a causal relationship so but on the other hand if you have a causal relationship you're always gonna have some kind of correlation um, to be more a little bit more precise on that um, let's say A is our uh, causal relationship here and causal basically means in that regard that um, s uh, something is uh, directly affecting something else and B is our correlation and correlation in that sense uh, doesn't necessarily uh, refer to a linear correlation like with a Pearson correlation coefficient or something similar it's actually much broader it can be like an exponential correlation it, it, it just means that there's some mutual information in two states hence if one state directly affects the other of course there's some kind of mutual information in those states hence you get A implies B and um, if you want to negate that thing you can also deduce from here that if you do not have any uh, correlation you cannot have a causal relationship but that's like the only two uh, like ideas you can uh, get from that um, concept you should never ever try to basically uh, um, yeah, get a, a causal relationship of, uh, out of something that's correlated and usually if you do some statistics um, even if it tells you it, it's like a causal method or something in 9 out of 10 cases it's still doing mathematically speaking something correlated hence it does not necessar uh, necessitate strict, uh, a strict causal relationship as yeah, everybody would understand it um, then we have two more topics. Uh, one topic uh, I quickly wanted to mention is the no free lunch theorem. That's going to be quite important for uh, next week's uh, session and the upcoming uh, machining, uh, machine learning sessions. Mm. The no free run, uh, lunch theory, uh, theorem basically says if you have uh, a method and you have a number of problems indicated by those bars here and you apply those methods to, um, to those problems you can get a specific um, profile of performance of course and usually if you have a specific method that's better for one of those uh, problems that's usually paid with degrading performance in, uh, for other problems meaning if you do some statistical uh, analysis or later on some machine learning you always got to um, basically um, think about what's the right approach for the thing you want to do what's a, a good way of doing uh, what you want to do instead of uh, simply applying some uh, method that you heard as fancy or you heard as, uh, heard as great because it's a pretty decent chance that method is tailored or at least expecting some kind of specific problem and it sh should get that kind of specific problem if you want to have like a high performance out of that method and the last concept uh, for this like somewhat introductory part is the central limit theorem which is not as important for this uh, workshop per se but that uh, um, concept is kind of I wanted to include it here because it's kind of used for a lot of uh, stuff and a lot of reasoning in papers and much of that is incorrect so you basically should have an idea of what it's saying and um, yeah, how it works and the central limit theorem basically states if you have um, some random distribution and that doesn't have to be normal distribution it can be like any distribution like this uh, beautiful non-normal distribution here and you get some data points from that and then you get another set of data points from that and then you get another set of data points from that and if you get the mean of each of those three different uh, drawings then if you take those mean values only indicated by uh, 
the red bars over here, those mean values in the end will have a normal distribution. And that's something you should keep in mind because, um, as I said, that theorems have um, often cited then people want to um, like um, justify why they uh, applied a certain method or a certain approach than doing a statistical analysis. And um, you should be uh, like, um, yeah, it, it, um, yeah, you should know whether that's actually applicable or not when you read that. So coming to the biases and uh, pitfalls uh, in statistics for this session. And um, I just uh, quickly wanted to mention that, um, <coughs> um, I'm gonna put it, um, yeah, um, I'm gonna uh, basically introduce a couple of concepts that um, you really should look out for then uh, doing your uh, studies because some of those errors that happen in there are gonna be non-reversible later on or they're gonna have like a severe impact of, uh, on whatever study you're doing. And um, actually I really enjoyed preparing this, to this topic because it's a really nice topic but on the other hand it was also really tough and it took a lot of effort to make this specific topic. Let's start with the survivorship bias. Let's imagine you're doing some um, analysis. You're back uh, in uh, World War II and um, you're uh, preparing your planes from uh, the British Isles for another raid on Germany. And of course some of them uh, come back, some of them don't come back and you want to maximize the number of the planes coming back because I mean that's uh, gonna make you win the war in the end. So you basically take those planes coming back and, they, uh, and then you look uh, where uh, did those planes get shot. And that the planes uh, did get shot is indicated here with those uh, individual red dots. And um, then you uh, gotta yeah, decide. You can put um, additional armor on those planes and my question for you would basically be, do you want to put that armor onto the places where the planes got hit? Do you want to do uh, put the armor on those places where uh, you um, don't see any uh, planes getting hit? Or do you want to do with some custom armoring? And yeah. Let's start the poll for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, as the name kind of uh, um, gives away a little, uh, calling this uh, the survivorship bias, you would not necessarily want to put your armor on the uh, leftmost pattern, because the leftmost pattern basically tells you which planes came back, got shot, but but still made it. So the parts indicated in the, with the red dots don't appear to be the parts that uh, basically yeah, uh, pulled them out of the sky. Theoretically, you could go with a middle pattern, but there's actually, uh, statistically speaking, there's absolutely nothing to back that up. It's basically a random guess, so it wouldn't be advisable either. What you want to do is you uh, want to go with the right pattern, because that's basically the places where, assuming the planes get equally shot all over the place, they did not come back. So that's what you want to look out for, um, out for with this one. And um, question in the end, how, 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 does, how does that apply to what we do in our everyday work? And um, when doing our studies, um, 
especially those long-term follow-up studies, you, you have patients dropping out of that study. And um, you always uh, got to ask yourself uh, which uh, patients drop out. Um, how are those dropouts distributed? If you, let's say, uh, do some kind of um, intervention and the other p um, group gets uh, sham treatment and hence doesn't profit from the treatment, is it equally likely that the dropouts are from the treatment group and the non-treatment group? If not, how do you uh, compensate for that? And if you basically um, fail to compensate that for all, you're gonna yeah, bias your resu uh, results. Uh, then you're gonna have the um, yeah, sampling bias, which is kind of similar to the survivorship bias. It's a little more broader in scope. Let's say you have your uh, population and you want to do some um, uh, testing on them and you basically, let's say you have some uh, a drug that you want to test on them, you split them into two groups and then um, you find that in the uh, left group your drug is more potent than the right group and when looking closer into that you could uh, see that um, there's the age difference between those two groups, which luckily doesn't happen uh, usually in our stuff because we control for age, which is really good. So let's just go with the next good one, high income. Let's say one of those groups has a higher income than the other. With that necessarily you're going to have a higher st uh, standard of living, which necessarily m uh, which might affect uh, the outcome of your study inadvertently. So basically means, well let's that to, uh, back to them. Um, you uh, when uh, doing your study and then sampling your population, you want to take care that um, your population, um, that uh, sampling you have with your population is uh, broad, but um, you want to especially look out for any possible confounding factors and have them equally distributed across the population you're sampling in, ordering, uh, in order to make sure that this is not affecting your results uh, to basically go in one way or the other way. And let's say like basically um, as if this was your study and um, you um, already sampled your population, you did your, uh, got your data and then you noticed there's some bias in them. Um, what what would you get do to get rid of that bias? Um, luckily, this you, you you can correct that still, assuming you can um, yeah go for one of those other three options. If you sample more patients, would be a good thing. Ideally, you want to go with the uh, uh, lowest option, like sampling additional underrepresented uh, subjects and then add them to your uh, rooster. Of course, then you're gonna make sure that you're not like uh, over over representing another subgroup in your rooster, so that that's still uh, balanced in terms of so of other factors. You can also use weights to adjust for the unequal sampling, but if you use weights uh, weights for the unequal sampling, you're gonna run into the issue that um, like um, if you want to go with a rather uh, um, strong example. Let's say you have uh, 10 subjects in one group and you have one subject in the other group. You can adjust for that with weights, basically given uh, that one subject 10 times the weight of the other subjects. But the more basically extreme that becomes, the more you are likely to underestimate the variability within your group and the more likely you are basically um, 
uh, actually looking at um, outliers instead of a representative sample. So when possible, I'd recommend to either go for um, yeah, additional samples, more samples, but if like if there's no other possibility, you can still um, yeah, apply some uh, weights to adjust for the unequal sampling. And um, yeah, as I already said, when doing your study and then sampling your population, you always gotta ask yourself uh, how generalizable is the population you're lo uh, looking at. And um, ideally, you don't ask uh, just um, ask a question that across the like whole spectrum of patients, because let's say uh, you already um, you did some uh, labeled uh, design and you already knew which of them are going to get the treatment, which of them uh, get, um, get the sham treatment or the placebo treatment, then you uh, want to uh, ask yourself, like, are they equally distributed, in, uh, are they, like, balanced uh, distributed into those two subgroups? Do I not have, like, any over-representation of a specific subgroup within either of these two groups? Uh, then we have the next concept, we have uh, the observation bias. Observation bias is basically if we have like an examiner here on the right side and we have a patient here on the left side and let's say um, the examiner does a questionnaire with the patient. Rather simple. On the other hand, we have the patient on the right side which can happily look out the window but has to do his questionnaire on its own. And simply from the examiner being with the left subject instead of being with the right you're gonna eff, um, have an effect on what the subject is gonna um, answer to the questionnaire, even if the questionnaire was uh, like 100% the same. So then, this, uh, when designing those present uh, those um, experiments, you gotta be careful whether your like your mere presence is gonna change how the um, yeah, subjects um, act in those uh, individual situations. But it also goes the other way around. If you had some uh, examiner, like the guy here on the left, and you have some patient, like the guy here on the right, and the examiner is doing some uh, yeah, uh, physical ev uh, evaluation on the patient, and you do that, like, let's say, in a, a normal setting, and then later on you do that in an uh, intraoperative setting because you want to evaluate something within the OR, you're likely going to um, affect the examinator at that point because. One uh, in the first setting, he was like uh, feeling relaxed. Uh, it was a well setting. The patient was looking fine. Ev everything was great. And in the other setting, you have uh, the patient lying in the OR, pr probably not feeling as good. And of, of course, the examiner is going to get that attention and that stress, and that's going to affect the measurement uh, you're going to get from that examiner. So, mm, next question again would be. How would you fix those biases? Um, unfortunately, you're not going to fix that one with adding more data points because uh, <laughs> some of the data points, or if you are like quite unlucky, all of those data points are, well, you, you, you consider them contaminated by a confounder. So adding more data points is, if, if added properly, just going to de uh, decrease the magnitude of that bias you're already having in your study, but you actually want to get rid of it. So if you base if you started with a um, crossover design, you can get rid of some of those biases, not all necessarily. 
Ideally, you, uh, you want a blind patient and examiner to treatment and um, conditions and whatever you are basically investigating to get an objective um, evaluation. So when investigating a state, you um, the like the the, um, the um, source where you get your information from and the m uh, method you're using to acquire that information, like the patient and the examiner should be as neutral as possible and uh, blinding both of them is the ideal solution to you know, achieve that goal. So, uh, when starting with this part, um, I yeah, spoke about something in this part I liked and about something I didn't like and I, I was just curious. Who of you recalls like th the good part, the bad part, or both parts? So, uh, that part is usually called the uh, record bias. And um, the record bias, um, yeah, as the name already says, means that if you hand your patients out a questionnaire or you ask them to do some interaction, um, that's going to be uh, dependent on uh, like yeah, uh, how, the how the patient recalls stuff. And for example, we know that as humans, we are more likely to recall bad news than positive news, um, which is kind of even reflected in that figure here. We uh, most of you recalled both uh, informations, uh, uh, pieces of information. Some of uh, you only the bad, and I, uh, how many is it? Like one, uh, one person uh, only recalled the good one. So um <coughs> yeah. And uh, when designing your questionnaire, so when asking for your patient interact, uh, when you're asking, designing something with a patient interaction in mind or something similar, you always got to keep that in mind. Let's say you want to do some uh, EEG and the patient has to press a button when he feels good and then he's going to feel bad. So um, you're way more likely to get a lot of button presses with bad feelings when you're going to get button presses with good feelings if you just ask for random mood because, I mean, that's in the uh, in the end would be uh, yeah, human nature. So um, you're gonna get an uh, um, underrepresented one state, uh, one state, and an overrepresented other state. And you gotta um, yeah, as I said, you gotta uh, consider this in your conceptual conceptualization and yeah, act accordingly in the end. Another part that may actually I hope not bias you is gonna be funding bias, and I look. Uh, that up and initially I was thinking that this was kind of a uh, uh, 1930s to 1970s or something thing then science was way more affected by money but it, it turns out it's not that way anyway uh, the first example of funding bias would be uh, this work here which is actually from the uh, 1970s published in the New England Journal of Medicine and they investigated whether it's um, Broadly speaking, whether it's uh, fat or whether it's sugar that's making people uh, fat, <laughs> and uh, they came up with uh, with the result that sugar is totally fine and it's the fat that's making you fat. Then we have this study here on the right, which was published in comparison way more recently, and uh, they found out that this study here on the left got uh, sixty-five thousand uh, fifty uh, fifty thousand dollars for uh, having the result of sugar not making you fat. 
And we have this fan uh, fantastic example here, um, which basically indicated that you are, t what was it? I think like 20% less likely to get COVID-19 if you are a smoker. They published that, got later on uh, retracted, as you can see, and they uh, did not disclose any competing interests, funding whatsoever. And uh, the paper got retracted because they got a grant from the uh, tobacco industry. So, um, and then we have another nice example here where um, the topic is um, yeah, climate prediction and global warming. And um, the review basically said that there's, um, yeah, um, that uh, global warming is a little overscaled and it's likely not going to be as impactful as we are um, expecting it to be. Basically saying till, what is that, 2050 we are gonna, uh, only going to increase by 0 0.09 uh, uh, degree, which is, would be great. And they also disclosed no conflict of interest or anything the like. And that worked for a little time. And uh, then uh, later they uh, got a news article that the authors of this paper here on the left side got, uh, over the course of 10 years, uh, what, what, what is it? Like, I think like 1.2 uh, million in funding from the um, uh, coal and uh, power industry. Which, not strictly speaking, has to have a specific effect on their results, but given that they didn't even disclose that, it's not unlikely. So, uh, with that out of the way, uh, uh, the irregardless of what you're basically um, investigating, um, investigate, like always try to keep an open mind. Any result is a good result as long as it's genuine. Let's go with a modeling bias. Let's say we have uh, two uh, distributions of samples, on the, uh, the one on the left side and the one on the right side. And my, uh, my question is if I did a t-test on those two samples here to investigate whether they are uh, significant, statistically significantly different. Uh, uh, would you think I'm going to get some valuable insight from that or not? Just going to go back to the other picture so you see the distribution again. Well, if you do a t-test on those, I mean, roughly uh, uh, one third of you said yes, and the other two thirds of you said no. If you do a t-test on those um, samples, as you probably noticed, I didn't even bother putting axes around them or something similar. Also, I, I have to mention at that point, it, it's little of a crab into next week's lecture where we're going to look way closer into what t-tests actually do. Uh, anyway, with a t-test, you're comparing the average, meaning you expect the average to be the most densest point in terms of um, uh, sample data. And neither the left, I mean, the left sample doesn't have like a almost any data points uh, in the, uh, the average, and the right one has some of them. And uh, since basically the assumptions of the t-test that the data has to be normally distributed are so grossly violated in this example, um, I wouldn't believe anything you derive from uh, executing a t-test on uh, that um, data because yeah, there would be a serial uh, reliability in the end. And um, actually found a really nice uh, example of uh, modeling bias um, online. 
in the Compass software and um, the Compass software is something they use in the US and it's determining the likelihood of it uh, uh, yeah, for, uh, for some, uh, somebody to be a person um, uh, at risk of uh, yeah, um, uh, doing something illegal again and um, then uh, the whether that uh, software was like genuine got analyzed from Pro, uh, Pro Publica, which has a political agenda behind those analyzers it does and of course they they selected specific samples then they evaluated the software on uh, those samples and they restricted themselves to uh, a, spe a specific uh, geographic location and stuff like that and that's that's modeling factors in the end and they came to re the result it's way more likely for uh, black people to be f uh, flagged as uh, risky than for white people, which is kind of interesting since the, the software uh, doesn't um, get any uh, racial information on the pe uh, people. It's um, somehow else deriving that, but that makes that software look racist. And um, then there was another assessment um, on that. Use different param uh, parameters, so... Um, a slightly different model, they came to the same conclusion and then we have the answer from the uh, company basically they used a third set of parameters and said, uh, came to the uh, conclusion that the software is absolutely genuine and there's no bias towards um, any kind of race or anything similar in the software and um, I just wanted to point out here that um, even if you have like um, uh, uh, solid samples, you evaluated them properly, you have uh, strong features in them. If you st start changing your model parameters, like what your statistics are gonna um, consider when evaluating the stuff later on, you can have largely different results. And let's take a look uh, where it uh, basically looks when we look into outliers. Let's say we want to do a correlation on this data set here. We're gonna get a real nice correlation and that correlation is gonna be mostly driven by this one point here. If we remove that point, we probably wouldn't say we have a correlation at all. But that also works the other way around. Like, here we, we don't have a correlation. But if we remove the data point over here, that looks like a correlation just now. And if we have something like that, we can even do uh, go both ways. If we remove this point, it doesn't look like a correlation. If we remove that point, it becomes a correlation. And we can also remove both of that points and it becomes a correlation again. Which means being a little bit similar to that uh, modeling bias, when removing outliers or doing something like that, you've got to be really careful because um, you can imprint your own expectations or hopes, e even if that's totally um, uh, not what you wanted to do in the first place. But let's say you you just like there to be a difference between two groups. Um, in that case, you, you just have a tendency of looking at stuff differently than uh, if it wouldn't matter to you at all. But you should always uh, strive to be uh, objective to that. And for example, with the outlier detection, you could be objective uh, uh, for um, um, in that regard if you apply the outlier rejection based on objective criteria. Like you remove any data point that's more than one standard deviation from the other data points or something like that. But if I remove this data point because it looks odd, or I remove this data point because it just doesn't fit with the others, I'm really running the uh, risk of um, even inadvertently, inadvertently creating some kind of result that otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, and the last topic for today is going to be uh, multiple comparison, which is kind of one of my favorite topics. And so far, uh, <coughs> it's kind of interesting uh, with multiple comparisons. Um, the higher you climb up the, la uh, the ladder, career-wise in academia, the more uh, uh, people you uh, the more you're going to find people that don't like the idea of uh, multiple comparison and the issues uh, associated with that. Um, let's start with a quick question here. Um, okay. Um, yeah. 
if you did a, a, some statistical hypothesis test and you did 20 of them, they are all totally independent. And each of them had an alpha value of 0 0.05. What would you expect would be like uh, the uh, overall error rate of at least one of them, for like, the, like the real alpha value? I like that uh, you guys are really optimistic and that's those error curves, the uh, associated ones. If you did one, uh, let's say you did one t-test, error rate of 5%, uh, you're of course going to get an error rate of 5%. If you do like 50 t-tests, then you're going to have a 92% percent, uh, of at least one of them giving you something uh, false positive. And um, 50 tests is not a lot. Let's say you did some EG study. You're gonna have 64 channels. So if you did a um, um, t-test on each of those channels, you're gonna end up with 64 hypotheses. Then let's say you're gonna do uh, multiple frequency bands, like three or four frequency bands. That's 64 times four. And um, y you're guaranteed to find something by that point. Even if you did a questionnaire like some uh, UPDAS or some, uh, something similar to associate, the, let's say, uh, assess, um, assess the um, impact of uh, Parkinsonis, uh, Parkinsonianism on, on patients, like how rigid they are, how bradykinetic they are, they, they have those individual subscores and they have like a lot of them. And if you did your statistical hypothesis on each of those uh, subscores, um, you're gonna end up with a lot of tests, meaning you're gonna have to correct for uh, um, multiple comparisons in some way. So um, that's something I wanted to basically uh, quickly mention here. And I think next week we're gonna have a couple of methods on how we are gonna correct for that. And mm, <coughs> sorry. I also quickly wanted to draw your attention to that uh, bluish 1% uh, bar here because like a lot of people think that if you put your error value at 1% you're pretty much uh, safe from that effect. But even if you uh, put that at 1% and do your 50 studies, you're gonna get uh, a false positive uh, rate not of 1% but of uh, 40. So, And that's kind of, uh, yeah summarize and that's a nice statement of uh, he who seeks finds meaning basically if you s uh, look for uh, um, look for some statistical significance long enough you're going to find some which is also what this uh, nice fellow here recapitul uh, re recapitulates by saying looking for someone found someone you have and you're gonna find someone if you're gonna uh, keep looking that's even a topic of one of those uh, XKCD uh, comics where people, uh, scientists are asked to investigate the relationship between acne and uh, cello beans and uh, initially didn't find a relationship so they did uh, one of those tests for each color. Uh, having an a error value of 5% doing 20 tests and one of them was positive and then the headline was uh, Green jello beans uh, linked to acne, 95% confidence, which is what you get if you don't correct for multiple comparisons, which is why it's crucial to do that. And as I said, next week we're gonna like introduce a couple of techniques on how to do that. Yeah, so next week we're gonna have statistics too. Statistics too is gonna be a little more applied again. 
So we are going to do some statistical modeling. Uh, yeah, as I already said, going to learn uh, how to look out for um, multiple com uh, multiple comparison issues, and we are going to um, yeah have some uh, samples again on good models and bad models, and use different uh, methods to do our statistical modeling. So, but that's it for today, and I hope you liked the lecture.